Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're having a lovely day. One of the things that I've noticed, one of the cultural shifts since I left New York City, is essentially how you deal with people that know what they're doing. What do I mean by that? Yeah, there's a rebel in all of us, especially in high school. And I remember back in high school, I found school to be very boring. I didn't like it very much. And because I found it boring and my teachers are boring, I got something called a Cohen A2. It's a Cohen a2 for, oh my God, half of my audience probably wasn't born when this thing came out. This is essentially a portable media player with a 30 gigabyte hard drive, which is absolutely amazing back then, that you could use to watch movies on and video files without having to transcode them. This thing had a 480 by 272 screen and could play video without transcoding, which is more than you could say for the iPod photo at the time. It's a pretty cool device. So what I used to do is I would you know, have my headphones and just because I wanted to show respect for the teacher in the classroom, I took my headphones wire because back then we didn't have wireless we had wires and why do I advocate to have a 2.5 3.5 millimeter jack on phones again oh, I should edit this out of the video I'm literally getting owned right now ah come on I have a video to do anyway so yeah anyway so what I would do is I would have my headphone going up the back of my shirt like this, and after it went up the back of my shirt so you couldn't really see it, it would come out over here, put it in my ear like this. I'd sit like this, and I'd pretend that I was writing in my book. And what I would do is I'd have my binder sitting over here, and then I would have a school book sitting over here, and on the other end of the school book was my Code A2, so that it would look like I'm writing, but what I'm actually doing is uh, watching season five of 24 to see if Jack Bauer kills Charles Logan. And this was an interesting thing to do, and I felt like this was a proper way to do it. Essentially, since the teacher could not see my headphone, I knew that if the assistant principal or a department had walked by and decided to examine the class, I would not make my teacher look stupid. In exchange for putting in all this effort to show respect for my teacher, usually my teacher would show me the courtesy of if he knew I was using my headphone, he would just listen. I'm not causing trouble. He would let it the hell be. Unfortunately, there were students that would ruin the class for everybody. You would have somebody, I'm never going to forget him. It was Albert in Miss Falanga's English class in 2002. He did this thing where he would have headphones in his head that were gigantic and he would have his Walkman turned up to full volume. And when he walked into the room, when he was late, he would walk over to his desk with the headphones in full volume and swagger. And then he would do this at his desk. He would actually take the headphones off of his ear, put them on his forehead, and then he would turn the volume all the way up to make up for the fact that the headphones were no longer on his ears, and then it was just the most obnoxious thing in the world. And the teacher would say, you can't play your headphones in class, get that off. Then what he would do is he would say, I wasn't even playing anything! I wasn't even playing anything! And he would actually pretend when it was so obvious what he was doing that he didn't do anything wrong. And then the teacher would become salty, and because the teacher became salty, the, she became more of an asshole, and she'd be mean to all of us, including the students that went out of their way to make it look like they were never listening to anything. She would be mean to all of us. We wouldn't be able to get as much stuff done, and as a result of not being able to get as much stuff done in class, she would give us more homework, and our lives would all be shittier because of one asshole. And essentially, at the end of the day, the problem is not that this person was breaking the rules, because I, too, was breaking the rules. Rather, it was the lack of acknowledgement of how breaking those rules made life worse, not simply for him, but for everybody else. And it was also a lack of acknowledgement that if you are going to break a rule, there are ways to break rules in manners that are somewhat considerate, and there are ways to break rules in manners that disrupt society. You know, I know, and especially, more than anybody else, he knows what he was doing. He didn't care. He pulled out every stop to pretend he was not doing something wrong while flagrantly doing something wrong. And it's a good parallel to how things work in New York City in general. That one experience that I had in ninth grade has been one of the best parallels to what it is like to live in New York City. I know at this point you're likely wondering what in the actual F am I talking about? Going over headphones in classrooms in ninth grade when this video is supposed to be about somebody who's being evicted. But it genuinely is a good parallel to how things work in New York City. In New York City, if somebody can prove that they have been in a home for 30 days, regardless of whether they're supposed to be there, that person can stay there. They have squatter's rights, and you cannot kick them out without going through court. Very often, the court in New York City is backed up anywhere from six months to 18 months. One of the things that I went over is that I took somebody to small claims court back in 2020, and I did not get a notification until, I'm not kidding, the end of 2023 that I would actually have a court date. So this is a process that can take very, very long because the New York City court system is very, very very fucked. 
like most elements of New York City bureaucracy. So let's go over this. This actually was reported by ABC. A woman named Anda Laurel inherited a home after her parents died. Someone went into the house, changed the front door and the lock on the house, and they were staying in the house. They admit they were not renting the house to the reporter. You can hear that in the audio. They claim, we didn't come in illegally, the door was open. Now, let's go over this in the parallel to my good friend from ninth grade. If you see a house with the door unlocked, there are many assumptions that you can make. Maybe the person who owns the house forgot to lock the door. Maybe the person who owned the house had a contract that they needed to show up and they didn't have a spare key. In what fucked up world do you assume that somebody left the door unlocked in a residential neighborhood because they wanted a random person that they don't know to invite all their friends there and sleep there when somebody else's property is clearly present and you know that this is not your fucking house? The problem I have above all else is fundamentally he knows what he did is wrong and there are ways to deal with it. Again, if I know that I'm breaking a rule, I'm going to try to break that rule in a manner that has the best possible outcome if I am caught, that demonstrates that even though I broke the rule and did something fucked up, I'm going to be respectable about it. And for most of my life, if I break a rule, but I either have a good reason or I'm respectable about it, I get a better outcome than I do if I break the rule and act like a degenerate piece of garbage, as I was discussing in my original example in my ninth grade class. If I break a rule, how can I minimize the impact or the fallout that other people have to experience or deal with as a result of what I did. And I do that because I had some semblance that we live in a society where making life better for the people around me makes life better for me. But in this case, that is the opposite. This person making life as miserable as possible for all the people he's around is what makes life better than him because of the rules and laws that New York City has enacted to defend degenerates at the expense of people who are doing what they're supposed to do. A grown woman has a baseline understanding of how the world works to know that this is not their property, it belongs to somebody else, and you don't have a right to it. But this is New York City, where things are different. Anda Laurel went to the house with her property deed showing it was her house. Somebody else answered, and she asked the two people in the house to get out of the house. Now, remember, in New York City, you need to show that you've been there for longer than 30 days. Since they had no documentation, the police escorted them out. One of them was arrested, and one of them was just politely asked to leave. She changed the lock so that these people could not simply invite themselves into a property that they knew was not theirs again. And in most parts of the country that are sane, if you were to do this, you would not be punished. But this is New York City. We don't value hard work people here, we punish them. Whether it is placing warrants on business owners that paid their taxes, or fining them for laws that they can't cite, and then putting them through four hours of hell staying on the phone to figure it out, or auditing them for over a year and a half for taxes that they didn't actually owe, or revoking business licenses and sending notices to people that paid their renewal fee one year ago. New York City is filled with many bureaucratic clusterfucks, but the thing that makes this one particularly egregious is that this is actually written into law. This is not somebody misinterpreting the law. They are interpreting the law as it is meant to be interpreted, which is even scarier. If somebody claims that they are a tenant, it is illegal to change the locks or remove them. To be clear, not is a tenant, claims they are a tenant. Very important. Right after the locks were changed, the man who said he was renting the house came with another man that the police had already escorted off minutes earlier. They went right back in the house. They pushed past the owner, and you have this on camera. Since she changed the locks on her own, they, she was the one that got in trouble for the police and arrested for unlawful eviction. Now, let's be clear here. You are not evicting somebody if they were never your tenant. The man claimed he was renting the house had no documentation of a lease. And again, if you listen to this clip on ABC News, you'll hear somebody else say, and I quote, quote, we're not renting. They ask, are you renting this? We're not renting. The man who claimed he was renting the house had no documentation of a lease. What he did, because he didn't have a documentation of a lease, is he showed a bill for work that he claimed he did to the house. And, um... Okay, so every time I've signed a lease in New York City, whether it was for a $700 shithole or a nice $2,200 apartment, we had to go to something called a notary. So I would have a lease, and to show that it was legitimately signed by both myself and the landlord, we went to a notary, whether, again, $700 a month or $2,200 a month. This is standard. Go to a notary, costs almost no money, you sign, and you know that it's legitimate. He didn't even have a lease that he made up. He had a bill. I could go to a library and for five cents in 10 minutes print out a fake bill for work that I did for somebody that is fraudulent, has no, again, no notary, no signature, no nothing. And this was enough for him to be able to actually stay in the house. The guy who broke into this house claims that he'll leave if she pays the bill. 
which he essentially made up. He also told the news, this is the best part, he told the news that he did have a lease, but why should I have to show you? I showed the police. I don't have to show you. I got nothing to prove. And then he shows the little bill that he made up on his phone. And then the news people walk straight over to the police and go, hey, did that guy show you a lease? And they said, no, just flat out no. So he doesn't have a lease. He lied to the news about showing a lease to the police. He didn't even have to show a lease to the police. Literally a document that he made up and pulled out of his ass was enough. The people staying in the house admitting on camera that they didn't rent it, again, with no evidence of a lease and saying they didn't rent it, was not enough for them to be kicked out. And they are living in the house while the owner of that house, whose name is on the deed, is sitting in jail. Like, for me, the problem here isn't even that somebody was homeless and decided to go into the house. Because again, there are ways to handle this. I have had bad times in my life myself, and that is what led me 15 years ago to living in a house that was filled with termites with an owner of the house that would say, what are you, Pinocchio? They're not after you. I understand people fall on hard times. And somebody who lives in New York City who sees the expense, who sees the struggle, tends to understand that as well. If you were found to be living in this house, you could say, listen, I am truly and genuinely sorry that I was in your home. The door was open, but that was no excuse for me to come into your home simply because the door is open. To be honest with you, it's kind of cold outside. I saw the door was open. I'm broke at the moment. I saw a place to stay inside that was better than a homeless shelter where I'm occupying space with a bunch of people who are drunk or high or God knows what, and I decided to take it. That's not right. I shouldn't have done that to you, and I'm sorry. Is there anything that I can do for you? Any service I can provide? Maybe clean this place up, mow your lawn, whatever the hell it is, to make it worth it to you to be able to sleep in this room for this time. Feel free to say no and I'll be on my way. I'm not saying that that would have gotten you the result you wanted, but that's probably a better way to go about it than the way that he actually went about it. What he did was he schemed, he lied, he falsified documents, he broke into somebody's house, and he had that person kicked out by the police after forcibly entering that person's home. In any other part of the country, that would have actually been the sensible thing to do because it has a higher likelihood of you getting along with the person who's the actual property owner. And it might have just kind of de-escalated the situation to the point where you could stay there long enough, long enough to find someplace else to go. But this is New York City. We don't reward people who do that here, which is why that is not a part of the culture, which is why you will never hear somebody say that when trying to negotiate something. What he did was actually the right thing to do for his environment. Break into a place, lie and be dishonest. After lie and be dishonest, continue that streak while simultaneously strong-arming your way into a home as a grown man pushing past an old lady. I almost can't even blame him. The law is written for degenerates. It's written to cater to scumbags. And as long as it caters to scumbags, why should they change their behavior in any way, shape, or form? What is the incentive structure or motivation for him to give that owner of the house a type of speech that I just gave right here in the hopes of being able to come up with a win-win solution for both of them to a situation that's not ideal? Why? Of course he wouldn't try to do that because that would actually have a higher level of likelihood of him not having a place to stay than this. Lying, cheating, and breaking in actually gives him a better chance, a better chance of staying there for 18 months than otherwise. Because again, right now, the owner of the house for changing the lock was put in handcuffs. And again, from my personal experience dealing with the court system in New York City, it can easily be three years before you even get a date. This guy could be living in her house for free for the next 18 months. And if he doesn't show up to court over the next 18 months, well, if he gets a job and he's pocketing all the money because he doesn't pay rent, he could easily, like 16 months in before the court date, just decide to move out with all the money that he saved from not paying rent and go somewhere else and not show up to court. And because, again, it's New York City, likely face no consequences. You get more of what you tolerate. And as long as you tolerate this and you create a system that punishes people who are doing the right thing and glorifies people who do the wrong thing, you will get more people who do the wrong thing. You get more of what you ask for and less of what you condemn. You condemn the person who owns the house for walking into their own house and you okay the person who broke into it on camera. That is no documentation other than some random unnotarized bullshit that he pulled out of his ass. I don't know what to say other than, I don't know. I'm happy with my decision. I look out my window, this is what I see here. I look out my window in New York City, this is what I see there. And it was more expensive in New York City than here. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. That's it for today, and as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you on the next video. Bye now. Remember, you get more of what you tolerate and less of what you don't.